Many of them never received a diagnosis of incapacity, even though it was obvious to everyone. The king was ill. Others, on the contrary, quickly turned into puppets for their families and courtiers. This is a tale of mad kings who, at different times, found themselves on the throne. Charles VI, known as the Mad King, is perhaps the most famous monarch to bear the title of Madman. He ruled France from 1380 to 1422, but in reality, his reign was much shorter due to his illness. The son of the wise king, ironically, his father was Charles V, the wise, married to a Bavarian princess, initially showed no signs of madness. Some noted that Charles seemed particularly passionate about revelry and hunted with an unusual zeal. So what? They attributed it to his fiery nature. However, in 1392, the king suffered a severe fever. After that, Charles became incredibly irritable. He would order a servant to be whipped for merely walking too loudly. He was annoyed by laughter, especially that of children, and developed a sensitivity to bright sunlight. It became unbearable for his eyes. One day, during a dance, they engaged in a dangerous game with candles, holding them while moving around the hall. One dancer's clothing caught fire, leading to a panic, and the king nearly fell into a fit of hysteria. It took monumental effort to calm him down. Soon after, a military campaign began. While in the forest, according to eyewitness accounts, the king encountered an old man who warned him of betrayal. This became a turning point. Charles VI, suddenly becoming completely unhinged, began to wave his weapon around and, in front of everyone, killed a page and then several others. The king was in a frenzy and could not calm down. From that time on, episodes of madness alternated with periods of calm. In his deranged state, Charles would beat his wife, attack servants, smash furniture, and refuse to bathe. Eventually, the queen moved to another palace, unable to endure what was happening. Starting around 1400, the full power of the state effectively belonged to Queen Isabella of Bavaria and the relatives of Charles VI. One of the mad. There are hundreds of volumes written about the madness of this lady. The heir to the famous Isabella and Ferdinand, Queen of Aragon and Castile, she was accused of insanity and imprisoned in a fortress. But was it really as it seemed? Juana was born in 1479 and was not meant to rule Spain. First, there were other heirs, and second, she was married off to Philip of Burgundy, an extremely ambitious and strikingly handsome man. Juana adored her husband, but it soon became clear that he did not feel the same way. His only interest lay in social status and the advantages Juana could bring him. By a twist of fate, all the children of the Spanish monarchs destined for the throne died one after another, leaving only Juana. In 1505, she was set to become the heir to the throne. However, her ambitious husband wanted the throne for himself, preferably without Juana. Her father also dreamed of retaining royal rights for himself. Intrigues began to unfold, and in 1506, Juana's husband passed away. It was Juana's father who started spreading rumors that his daughter was mad. He claimed that Juana would throw herself on her deceased husband's coffin, open it, and kiss the decaying body. Yet everything seemed too conveniently timed. Juana was extremely inconvenient for Ferdinand, and suddenly she was declared insane. The Cortes chose not to investigate. Her father remained king, and the rights to both kingdoms, Castile and Aragon were passed to Juana's son. The unfortunate queen was sent to a fortress, where she remained imprisoned for a long 46 years. When her son eventually became king, she held on to a faint hope that she might be released, but the new monarch, Charles V of Habsburg, preferred to forget about his mother. She was also inconvenient for him. After all, Juana had claims to the throne. Legally, neither her father nor her son could rule while she was alive. The diagnosis of madness went unchallenged. Juana died in captivity. Rudolf II, this emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, was highly educated, well-versed in art, and passionately collected paintings and jewels. However, he harbored a secret obsession. 
alchemy. Rudolph was consumed by dreams of eternal life, longing to discover the elixir of immortality or the philosopher's stone to turn any metal into gold, both enticing pursuits. Any obscure astrologer in Europe knew that they should seek out Rudolph. In his welcoming Prague castle, there was always a place at the lavishly set table and a few gold coins to be earned for a glimpse into the future. But gradually, the emperor's obsession spiraled out of control. Charlatans received incredible subsidies from the treasury, causing great discontent among the nobility. Whispers began to circulate about the emperor's activities and experiments. Who really knew what he was up to? What if he was a secret sorcerer or black magician? Rudolph's health began to decline. He would slip into deep melancholy, only to be overtaken by bouts of wild rage. He became intensely paranoid, convinced that conspiracies and assassination attempts lurked around every corner. His close associates kept their distance, and he didn't seem to mind. He was always accompanied by a pet lion, leopards, and eagles, all of which he had tamed. Ultimately, this story did not end well. Rudolph was forced to abdicate the throne, and soon after, he died. Rumors circulated that his unfortunate fate was a direct result of his dabbling with otherworldly forces. Christian VII, King of Denmark, yet another mad monarch. From the very beginning, it was clear that this king, born in 1749, had his challenges. A nervous, sickly child, he fell under the supervision of a particularly harsh tutor. Modern scholars believe that if Christian had received more love and affection during his childhood, perhaps his madness would not have manifested so dramatically. When the king married, everyone in his circle was aware of his condition, everyone except his young bride. Christian would alternate between becoming an icy statue, withdrawing from all interaction, and wandering the streets of Copenhagen at night in the company of prostitutes and other unsavory characters. Naturally, the young queen, neglected by her husband, soon took a lover. If Christian's wife had been a bit wiser, she could have easily won him over. However, lacking life experience, she allowed her stepmother, the dowager Queen Juliana Maria, to seize control over Christian and his decisions. This woman managed to expose the infidelity of Christian's wife and banish her, effectively consolidating power in the kingdom. Christian died in 1808, succumbing to a panic attack, convinced that foreign troops were invading the city. 20th century doctors concluded that the Danish monarch suffered from schizophrenia. Philip V of Spain became a living testament to the dangers of inbreeding. On one hand, he inherited the sickly genes of the Habsburgs, who had literally intermarried within their own family for generations. On the other, he carried the genes of the Bourbons, closely tied to the same Habsburg lineage. Initially, everything seemed to go wonderfully. The French prince secured the Spanish throne. Naturally, this did not sit well with many European monarchs who coveted a similar fate for themselves. Thus began the exhausting war of the Spanish succession. Yet, Philip remained on his throne. It wasn't easy for him. Neighboring powers were at each other's throats, desperate to oust him from Madrid, pouring money and resources into military campaigns. Philip tried to counter their efforts, but the dire circumstances and the constant need to act took a toll on his mental health. He fell into deep melancholy. Philip V could spend days locked away in a room with tightly shut and draped windows, refusing to eat or drink. The exhaustion that inevitably followed would require treatment from doctors and his wife. He would eventually recover, only to succumb to another episode. In the year 1724, Philip realized he could no longer bear the burden of power. It had become too heavy, and he abdicated in favor of his son. Alas, Prince Louis unexpectedly died, forcing the king to take up the reins of governance once more. The king refused to change his clothes or get a haircut. He lay in bed, motionless and it was nearly impossible to persuade him to sign any documents. However, Queen Elizabeth found a solution. She discovered that beautiful singing had a positive effect on the king and invited the renowned singer Farinelli to court. Thanks to Farinelli's voice, 
King Philip would briefly return to his duties. Maria I, known as Maria the Mad, was the Queen of Portugal. Even her official portrait depicts a young woman who appears far from healthy. Her face twisted by a nervous tick, gaunt features, and bulging eyes. Maria of Portugal was certainly not a beauty, and her descent into madness did not happen overnight. At the age of 26, Maria was married off to her own uncle. Her father had long hoped that his wife would bear him a son, but instead, King Joseph I had four daughters in a row. To prevent a potential civil war, the king decided to marry his daughter to his brother. In the year 1777, Maria became the Queen of Portugal with her husband as king. Their reign was relatively peaceful, and they were a loving couple. However, when Maria's husband passed away in 1786, she was unable to cope with the loss. The court immediately fell into mourning. The queen banned all forms of entertainment in the capital. One could be fined or even jailed for simply smiling. Even at family weddings, Maria maintained a tortured expression, as did all the guests. When the church bells rang, the queen suffered a seizure. Maria was taken to her chambers, where she convulsed and raved. Doctors tried to calm her, but her condition continued to deteriorate. From that moment on, she rarely regained her senses. After six years, her situation became dire. She was declared insane, and her son had to proclaim himself regent. Interestingly, in the final years of her life, Maria had to relocate to Brazil due to Napoleon's conquests, which were sweeping through one European kingdom after another. The entire Portuguese royal family emigrated. Remarkably, Maria managed the ocean voyage surprisingly well. She hardly screamed and spent most of the time sleeping. She died on Brazilian soil and was buried there. A curious note, back in Portugal, she was under the care of the same doctor who tended to the mental health of King George III, whose story will follow. George III, the King of England, was a long-reigning monarch who witnessed monumental events during his lifetime. The French Revolution, the separation of the American colonies from England, and the war against Napoleon. The king had a passion for the theater and a good joke, enjoyed gardening, and even dabbled in making buttons from ivory. He was fascinated by astronomy and would spend hours gazing at the night sky through William Herschel's telescope. The king paid £4,000 for his telescope, an amount that could have purchased a sizable estate in the 18th century. In his youth, George was quite active, although not all of his actions were well received by the public. For instance, he survived two assassination attempts, both of which led to the attackers being placed in psychiatric institutions. The king's mental health issues first became apparent in 1789, as he suffered from hereditary porphyria, a terrible illness that rendered him completely unhinged during its episodes. In the year 1810, George lost his beloved daughter, Amelia, and this blow proved too much for him to bear. After that, he never experienced another lucid moment. He remained in a constant state of madness. From 1811 onward, his son George ruled England as regent. The Mad King lived for another nine years. At one point, he began to refuse food, ultimately succumbing to starvation on January 29, 1820.